everyone, Pine and Apple here with the next film in our slow MCU trek, The Incredible Hulk. Probably one of the most forgotten, or in people's lowest five, of the MCU films. But is it really as bad as people remember it? After looking back at some clips and reviews, I was reminded of the... event that was Hulk 2003. I was hesitant to spend my time on this film that was made so soon after the original, akin to the feeling of having two recasts of Spider-Man less than 20 years. But honestly, after seeing this, even if it feels a little odd, like with it not having the same Hulk actor as the other MCU films, I don't think it could manage being as strange as Hulk 2003. Honestly, I barely remember what happened in this film before my rewatch. I just knew that there was a Hulk, Ross, the leader, Abomination, and that it probably had Stan Lee in it. But I do have some fun memories associated with it, as on my Wii, one of the regularly played games at one point was The Incredible Hulk's Adaptation, with great exclusive characters, fun destruction, and travel mechanics. I remember the game being great, so let's hope the film can reach the same heights as we get into the characters. So we should probably start with the titular Incredible Hulk, or for most of this film, Bruce Banner, played by Edward Norton of Fight Club fame. Much like many of the performances, his character really only worked for me 70% of the time, because there are some odd line readings in this film, and sometimes the emotion that should be in some scenes falls completely flat. But for me, that 70%, I really liked our protagonist. His love for Betty and inner conflict about the Hulk were believable and impactful, even if some of the stuff with Betty just felt droning. His fish-out-of-water attitude when roaming from country to country was one of the best aspects of the character, being able to actually have a smile on his face, unlike the Hulk itself. Bruce Banner works better in his performance when not brooding or deep in thought, but when he's happy, complacent, or reminiscing. Now, for the Hulk itself. Apparently still voiced by Lou Ferrigno, who played the original TV Hulk. The way they used the Hulk in this film was very on and off. And I can talk about clear examples when we get to the plot portion. But on the whole, I'm confident in saying that it was pretty good. Not amazing, but from the perspective of Little Me in 2008, I think it would have worked fantastically. Next is one of our bad guys, General Thunderbolt Ross. Played by William Hurt, who you may have seen in one of the many media projects named Lost in Space. The Joey one. As an antagonist, he may be a little too evil for the sake of it. Unlike Blonsky, who it works for, when Ross starts being evil for the sake of it, it doesn't really work or match the character that we've been shown. But as a man who hates the thing that hurt his child, and has such devotion to the army he will sanction experimentation, he works as a secondary antagonist, having more of a connection to the other characters dramatically when compared to Abomination. William Hurt did pretty good acting as this character, so good that unlike Edward Norton, he was brought back for multiple MCU projects after this. Our lead's romantic interest and daughter of General Ross is Betty Ross, played by Liv Tyler. Liv Tyler as Betty Ross was... well... not that good. I found that whenever she was paired up with Banner, the tone and performance became insufferable, quiet, and flat. But when she gets highly emotional, such as with Bruce mid-transformation, or when angry at a cab driver and her asshole father, she can display pretty good scenes of emotion. That's really all I have to say on the character. As far as I know, this is her only appearance in the MCU, perhaps apart from What If. But unfortunately, I can see why. Maybe it was the direction, or maybe she just didn't have chemistry with Norton. But I did see some good acting bleeding through from her, so I can't blame Liv Tyler completely. Our secondary antagonist is Emil Blonsky, aka Abomination, played by Tim Roth, seen in Pulp Fiction and returning to the MCU in She-Hulk and Shang-Chi. And although he can be a little ham or just plain evil with no justification, he was really enjoyable here. Tim Roth's performance is spot on, and although the dialogue can sound out of place once or twice, for the most part, his character works not just as a great antagonist, but as an individual character in his own right. More than just another cog in the story. 
His turn from intimidating and ruthless soldier to murderous psychomaniac is a good one. We see him slowly spiral out of control, faced with the might of the Hulk and seeking to outmatch him. Taking more and more drastic decisions was great to watch. I mean, we knew he was bad from the beginning, but to see the evolution of a character is a large point in the film's favour, and something quite different from the villains we saw in Iron Man in the preceding film. Our last main player and kind of antagonist is Samuel Stearns, known as the leader in the comics, played by Tim Blake Nelson, and served his purpose well. Tim Blake Nelson played the character well, and even though we don't see him for most of the film, he is sufficiently peppered throughout the early parts of the movie to make a decent payoff as a secondary antagonist. Or, really, tertiary antagonist. The character's motivations were understandable, and his team-up with Abomination was interesting for the short while it was there. His dialogue could have been made slightly better, but this wasn't going to be a 10 out of 10 movie anyway. So I think this character was a good addition in the scheme of things. Lastly, we do have one minor character, who I didn't learn the name of, so I'll just call him Phil Dunphy. He ain't there for long, but gets some decent dialogue, and we will talk more about his character later. He's kind of stuck in the void between unnecessary character and character that desperately needs more dialogue in this movie. Now let's talk about the plot. So we start the film with a very of its time opening sequence that speeds us through the Hulk's creation and setting up Ross's motivations quite well. Looking pretty cool and getting us into the meat of the story far quicker than the first Hulk movie. Which I think was a great choice, even if some of the shots are quite strange. Like the Hulk CGI and the... <laughs> and this look that Ross gives Betty. I don't know why I find it so funny, but it just looks ridiculous. Ross hunts Bruce and we are taken to where Bruce is now, in a foreign country long after the incident, telling us that with a nifty counter that it has been 158 days since his last Hulk transformation. We see the lay of the land with a nice overhead shot of Brazil and we get a good look into Bruce's current life. We see him train in a scene that usually I would find a little ridiculous, but it's actually kind of interesting. Then following him to work at this soda bottling plant, he gets eye banged by a co-worker and we are shown both his ingenuity and his kindness as he helps his boss patch up the machinery. Bruce gets a cut and his gamma ray infested blood gets into a bottle. The camera work and music really selling us on the importance and danger of this incident. But unfortunately, a bit of blood does get into a drink, even though he tries to clean it up. And even though it was right in front of him as he tried to clean it up. So, yeah, that probably could have been shot better. The girl who was eye-fucking him is cornered by some assholes, and he tries to help, but fails in a humorous fashion that honestly felt kind of out of place, but certainly felt better than some of the current jokes Marvel likes to pull. Bruce gets some material off someone and tries to create a cure for himself corresponding with an anonymous partner, Mr. Blue. Unfortunately, the serum doesn't take, so Mr. Blue wants a blood sample of his to help. Bruce is reluctant, but does so anyway, posing in the street as he mulls over his decision. Back in the US, Stanley is poisoned by Bruce's blood, giving Ross a lead to Bruce's location. Ross decided to go for him in person, with the assistance of many armed men and their quote-unquote Ace, Emil Blonsky, who gets a cool army hero entrance. Ross rallies his men with orders to trank Bruce, as he is given promising news from Mr. Blue, who needs more data. Said data being left at the university Bruce worked at with Betty. The grunts find Bruce and give chase after Emil shows us just how much of an arsehole he is by tranking Bruce's dog. This leads into a fantastic chase scene. Really, it's shock great has tense music, and the action plus acting is done pretty well. Even for such a different chase than what we would usually get, the unique Brazilian environment really lending itself greatly to the scene, like one of those YouTube parkour videos. Unfortunately, Bruce runs into the assholes from before, laying them out on the ground, and is chased to the factory, where both the assholes and the army follow him to. Or really, I could probably just call both factions assholes. The assholes get to him, harassing him so much that he hulks out. These guys acting as assholes is done quite well. And then we get our first proper scene with the Hulk, who wrecks shop, attacking assholes and soldiers in brutal fashion. I thought the scene was quite well done. 
The decision to keep the Hulk in the dark, a great one to help keep these scenes long lasting, as sometimes the CGI does let the scene down. But this is done far less as we are shown far less detail. The Hulk moving in the background like it's a Sasquatch video. I like the Hulk's design here, especially the face. But he escapes leaving Ross and Blonsky to argue and try to figure out where he's going. Emil is in shock, shown with great dialogue and acting as they discuss the Hulk. Speaking of, Bruce wakes up in a river, apparently now in Guatemala, hitchhiking to the nearest town, with our incident counter going back down. And honestly, this visual choice is a little strange, as I wasn't sure whether it was counting back down was meant to be funny or dramatic. All it needs is a little cartoon music there and you have a joke. Emil is interested in the Hulk enough to pledge himself to the cause, as Bruce skulks around, busking his way back to America, as Ross discusses everything about the reasons the Hulk was created, relating to the Captain America Super Soldier Serum. Bruce makes his way back to campus and is nearly spotted by Betty as he stalks her. And she meets Phil for coffee. The less interesting man she has filled the Bruce-shaped hole in her life with. Bruce goes back to his friend Stan's place to stay and the next day bribes Lou Ferrigno into getting him access. Meeting a future character from the next Spider-Man movies in the MCU like eight movies after this film. Bruce searches, but the info he needs is deleted. But an arrival from Betty and Phil puts a spanner in Bruce's night as she starts to ignore her boyfriend, who is spouting gibberish, so that she can stand in an alleyway in hopes of seeing Bruce. Bruce walks away sadly in the rain, but is picked up by Betty in a reunion that would be far more touching if we had seen more than three scenes of Betty. Or if we knew where her boyfriend was, because he's just kind of not there. She takes him back home and the two of them talk shop, learning that she has not seen Ross in a while. And these scenes at her house really exemplify why I don't think these two work for each other. She's far too flat using the same gentle and vapid tone through their whole talk, and he is given nothing special from her or the dialogue to work with. Meanwhile, in Great Actors Land, Ross finds a cryo sample of the Super Soldier Serum and then we are taken straight back to these two silently contemplating their feelings. Blonsky is given the serum in an actually grueling and pretty disturbing scene. As our no chemistry duo share what is meant to be a nice scene, but mostly consists of longing stares and then avoiding eye contact. The armies find Bruce and chase after him. Betty told to leave, but following anyway. Blonsky breaks formation and runs twice as fast as the other soldiers to catch up in a cool looking effect that even Wonder Woman 1984 couldn't pull off right. Banner leads his pursuers through a campus building, using precious time to hide the data Betty gave him by swallowing it. Ooh, he's going to need to sort through his shit with a potato mash to get that back. Betty spends time distracting her dad in a good show of emotion, and Bruce is cornered in this really cool looking part of the building giving us a great visual as he is gassed and the Hulk comes out. Betty gets a good hit in to a soldier, but is distracted as the Hulk starts attacking. Now out in the open, the Hulk effects are very hit and miss, watching it today. But I would say that for the most part, it still holds up. And I think this is not only the VFX itself, but the way the film is shot adds cohesiveness between the Hulk and the mayhem he wreaks. But as I just said before, not all of it holds up perfectly. This awesome action continues as Blonsky goes after the Hulk, with some uni douche filming it the whole time. But we see that Blonsky starts showing signs of disobeying orders, something that Ross had been worried about, but promptly forgets his fears after this. The Hulk is hit with some Stark tech he eventually destroys after getting his second wind, and Betty gets some more good emotive action as she tries to make Ross stop the machines. Blonsky is left in a pile of bones, and Phil makes it onto the scene to try and save Betty. How he knew this was happening, we don't know, but we'll talk about the missing parts of his character later. Betty tries to save the Hulk, much to Ross's panic. Hulk protects Betty, as they should be roasted alive, and the Hulk leaves, giving us a more emotive performance through CGI than Liv Taylor has given so far. We have our final scene with Phil, where Ross thanks him for betraying them. And Phil gets some good points in, standing up to Ross in an honestly badass scene that I would like to see this actor do more like this. 
Too bad the modern family is the only thing I've seen him in. Hulk and Betty have a nice scene in the rains on a cliff where he tries to protect her from the thunder, a nice display of their relationship and how the Hulk works when relating to Bruce's psyche, if you want to read into it more. And we see that the beaten Emil is starting to heal. Bruce is back and the two of them have some nice moments and introduce a little bit of levity into their conversation, making them far more bearable. The Hulk gets named by those uni guys and we get half a minute of Bruce's haircut and what I think may be the steamiest MCU sexy time we've ever gotten. But unfortunately, he can't get it up or the Hulk will butt in. Well, that happened and I don't think I ever want to see that happen again. Meanwhile, Blonsky is apparently fully healed and they've made the genius decision to keep him on the case. Fucking idiots. Our heroes seek out Mr. Blue and head towards him, but the emails are intercepted thanks to S.H.I.E.L.D. looking for their aliases. Mr. Blue is apparently Samuel Stearns, and we have to sit through a slog of a scene where these two discuss how it feels to be the Hulk. It's like Betty is trying to whisper every word, and either the writing or Norton just can't get the feeling of his inner dilemma across. Emil takes more serum, and after a maybe racist taxi stereotype, and an uncharacteristically good dialogue between these two, they reach Stearns, who is a pretty good character, a bit overdramatic, but works well in his quirkiness. He lays out the warnings of the Hulk's solution to Banner, but they decide to go through with it anyway as the army load up and Emil starts to mutate, looking like he's halfway between catching Ebola and becoming a Wendigo. The next scene is where they try to remove the Hulk. It's a little drawn out, but I feel like it works well enough. Stearns is entertaining, Betty actually gets out a little emotion, and the Hulk looks great for the most part. Stearns accidentally mentions that he's been experimenting on other subjects using Bruce's blood as a base, making him our twist kind of villain, as the army gets ready to gank him. Stearns wants to use his blood to help people at least, but Bruce doesn't agree. Unfortunately, before he does anything, Blonsky gets Bruce, wanting to see the Hulk, but captures Bruce instead and giving a pretty severe hit to Betty. Ross threatens Bruce and Betty rightfully tells him to fuck off. A scene where her whisper of a performance actually adds to the seriousness of the scene. A Mill and Stearns get on like a house on fire and they work together to give Blonsky Bruce's blood with a good name drop of Abomination. Abomination is created and so is a loose plot thread that will probably never be picked up and in a nice continuous shot from the ground level, Ross learns of their new foe. The army men from before ram through the street and attempt to fight Abomination as our other characters watch from the plane. The cops and soldiers fight with all they have but make no dent on Abomination who I must say even with the CGI becoming dodgy every now and then looks pretty cool as he rampages and later fights Hulk. Bruce has the idea to force the Hulk out and erect him against Abomination, choosing to jump out of the back of the plane, saying goodbye in another decent Betty scene. Not good, but decent. He falls and the Hulk bursts through the ground, ready to fight Abomination on this really cool looking stretch of road. They blow past the Apollo Theatre and having a pretty good and decently paced fight, even with Ross trying to help. Eventually, they crash the chopper and have one final fight, with Betty saving Ross and Abomination and Hulk having quite a brutal finale, eventually saving both Betty and Ross in the end. Betty convinces Hulk to spare Abomination by being there, and Ross kind of just lets him leave. Later, a camera with a photo of Bruce runs out of battery. I suppose that's symbolism, I guess? And we finish with Bruce, alone in a cabin in the woods, about to send a necklace back to Betty as he starts to try and control the Hulk, in another ridiculous use of the incident counter. We also get a scene of Ross drowning his sorrows, only for Tony to come in from his previous film, and both gloats and brings up a team. But we will explore that in another review. Honestly, that little scene would probably blow some minds considering how the MCU wasn't as prominent as it is now. And I'm sure those who went to see a movie about the Hulk had probably seen Iron Man, making this work far better than something like The End of Split, where it references a movie from so many years ago to sequel bait. 
As said before, there are interesting and smart decisions here when it comes to the cinematography. I think the camera work itself was good, but the planning of shots and integration of the CGI within them took creativity, such as many choices to keep the Hulk in dark areas, or his face obscured, yet still being able to tell what's going on, unlike some modern action movies. Contextual landmark shots were also done well here. I love the shots of the Brazilian rooftops, and the action there was well shot as well. Now, talking about the OST, when it comes to it, not many songs stand out as remarkable, especially out of context. But when paired with what's on screen, I feel that most of the OST does wonders adding to the scenes they star in. As I said before, nothing groundbreaking, but I did notice when attracted well to accentuate the scene. Now, a big thing I wanted to touch on in this film was some deleted scenes. Before we wrap this up, some are strange, like this time spent watching Bruce deliver uni pizzas for what I assume is comedic purposes, but some things really should have been in here, or considered at least. Firstly, there are a lot of scenes of Phil and Bruce interacting that were lacking. In the movie, we're just told that Phil called Ross, but in these deleted scenes, we're shown that he was actually at home with Betty when they were hiding Bruce. And if this character had been in the film more, I might have remembered his real name, not just keep calling him Phil. There is also added context to Ross's motivations. In the film, you could interpret them as him actually wanting to help people in parts. But in these scenes, we really see that he wanted to harness the Hulk more than what we saw. There was even an alternate opening show where Bruce goes into the middle of nowhere to supposedly kill himself, prompting the Hulk to come out in a grand fashion. But seriously, Phil was cut too much from this film. He is in more cutscenes than he is in the actual movie. And even if Betty still whispers half her lines, she gets some great dialogue here too. I feel like if the heavier toned, more dialogue driven scenes were kept in this film, it probably would be seen in a better light. Not as close to Iron Man or Endgame level, but certainly better than it's usually described as. So, in summary, this film wasn't as bad as I remember. Or as I hear it is on the regular. Although it could have done far better judging by the scenes that have been taken out. The characters were decent all around, even if some of the dialogue and performances felt a little lacking. The cinematography and OST were great, and worked well in conjunction from what I remember. Although nods were small, it did well to fit references into it, to make it slot easily into the at the time, new MCU. Far subtler than some of the recent movies, and it actually did well to lead into our next MCU film, Iron Man 2, showing Tony at the end. So, not the best, but better than I thought. I'll give The Incredible Hulk, written by Zack Penn and directed by Louis Leteria, a healthy 5 out of 10. And on the rewatchability scale, I'll give it a speed run. Not really missing much if you skip it, but it is worth at least one revisit once this whole MCU thing is over in 20 years. Thank you everybody so much for watching my review of The Incredible Hulk. Please like the video if you liked it, consider subscribing, and if you do ring that notification bell, so you're told every single time that I make an upload. Also comment down below if there's something interesting about the Hulk you want to talk about, or if you want me to cover something in the future. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Now she's an annoying bitch. Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages with writing on the side.